and I'd mentioned the fact that um, the, um, the, the precipitation sequence is, um, can be rather complex. Um, so uh, just to um, uh, repeat what we said at the end of um, lecture on uh, last Thursday. Uh, so titanium will not only stabilize uh, nitrogen at high temperature and is very efficient in doing this, um, but it will also uh, bind sulfur as a sulfide or as a carbosulfide, yes? Um, and I, I stress the fact that this carbosulfide is really interesting precipitate because it's the only precipitate that binds carbon at high temperatures, yes? Um, but it requires, because of its solubility uh, product, it requires, it would require, for instance, the use of low reheating temperatures. And if you do that, you can precipitate it, uh, uh, carbon in, uh, at high temperatures, and, and you do get um, better properties also. Um, it's only after, uh, at, at lower temperatures, and in particular in the ferrite phase, that you, that you really start to uh, form uh, titanium carbide. Hmm? Titanium carbide. Hmm? Um, now, um, I also mentioned the fact that in standard IF steels, titanium IF steel, you always add a considerable amount of excess titanium. That gives rise to surface defects, oxides related to this uh, titanium excess. And so um, when you galvanize the material, I should uh, uh, add to this, so galvanized materials have these surface defects. The um, um, steel industries then develop what is called the titanium niobium IF steels, where the, the, the nitrogen is stabilized by the uh, titanium and the carbon is stabilized by the uh, niobium and um, and there is no need for these large uh, excess uh, titanium values so in, important here hmm? I want to stress this um, yeah that the um, so the the nitrides of titanium are much less soluble uh, than in uh, than the carbides yes um, and the, the, the reason um, why you, uh, you have to wait for the, uh, the formation of titanium carbide that you are in ferrite is, is the drop in solubility, yes? That you, when you go from gamma to alpha, there's a serious drop in solubility of the titanium carbide and, and you, you form uh, precipitates. Okay. So let's have a, f a look here at a number of um, typical uh, grades that are uh, produced. Mm -hmm. So we'll, um, we'll look at some um, standards, so first a number of European standards. Um, low carbon steels, IF steels, are steels that develop for formability, for their formability, right, as, as sheet material mainly. Um, so. Uh, Deep drawing uh, qualities. And, uh, so you know that these, uh, according to this standard, the, the first D is refers to drawing qualities. Yes. The second D here is not drawing. It refers to the fact that it's hot rolled. Okay. So we have uh, about uh, well, the main grades are these four ones here. Yes. So D stands for. In this case, it's it's. Um, it's a, um, a, a table that uh, reviews the main hot rolled low carbon grade. So the first D stands for drawing, the second D stands for uh, hot rolled, and the numbers here, 11, 12, 13, and 14, are just, uh, just numbers. They uh, refer to increasing uh, formability, going from 11 to 14. And, and this is achieved by, not surprisingly, a reduction in the alloy content. So you see here the maximum amount of carbon is reduced, the maximum of manganese, phosphorus, and sulfur all reduced, yes, for formability. Okay, these, what are the properties, yes? 
Well, let's look at the, the properties that, are, that would be used in, in automotive applications for thicknesses 1.5 to 2. 170 to 300 yield strengths and, and um, tensile strengths less than 400 megapascal. And elongations, hmm, total elongations are, uh, are very large, hmm, more than 20%. Hmm. And in the last one here, this DD14, more than 30%. These, uh, these are not typical values, right? These are the, 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 the values set by the standards, yeah? So they're, they're, um, uh, the, the properties can be much better in practice, and we'll, we'll see a few numbers here. Um, same here, uh, hot rolled grades according to GIST standards that uh, you can compare. So you remember here for GIST, S stands for steel, and uh, P stands for plain carbon steels, and then these um, uh, C here stands for commercial drawing, etc., extra drawing, um, and the H here is for hot rolled. Okay, so you d that way you can this list allows you to compare these two types of grade. A U.S. Um, some um, typical grades here you have uh, drawing steel DS type A and type B. Again, um, low carbon contents. Low values, again, these are low carbon steels, they're not IF steels, right? So, so you're looking at 200 to 400 ppm um, uh, carbon, typically. Low, f low manganese, less than 0.5, low, where is silicon here? Oh, I, didn't have, I don't have silicon, but that's low too, less than 0.1. Okay, so it's very, um, very little alloying at all, yes? And uh, these are typical values in terms of the tensile strength. If you want to know values, you have to multiply by about seven if you want equivalent uh, megapascal values. So that would be 200 to 350 um, uh, megapascal. Hmm? Okay, so comparable to what the European norms give. Hmm? Um, you have formable hot rolled grades, you have formable cold rolled grades. Formable cold rolled grades, uh, again, if you look at the European um, standards, D for drawing, C for cold rolling, and then the numbers one, three, four, five, six here, uh, just refer to in increasing formability. And you see here that only the DCO6, yes, contains Titanium, hmm? okay? So um, that means that's the only one that needs, that, that, uh, that requires uh, the carbon and the nitrogen to be stabilized, hmm? okay? Um, these grades uh, have to satisfy a requirement that they're not non-aging for 50, uh, for, excuse me, for six months. Why, why would that uh, be a requirement? Well. Uh, many um, uh, customers will buy coils, yes, and then store them for a while till they need them, yes. So that storage period can, can be a few months, for instance, if it's automotive um, company uh, doing uh, buying, so they'll store them. And, uh, and so they want to make sure that um, there is no strain aging hmm, when they start processing this material. So that's this, this additional requirement. Hmm? And uh, again, uh, titanium, uh, usually uh, indicated in these standards, can be substituted by niobium to stabilize carbon and nitrogen. Usually, uh, you will, will actually see a combination of titanium and, and niobium. Hmm? So if we look at the properties, hmm, you see that the, the, these steels are softer than their hot rolled counterpart, yes? Uh, 100 and, uh, 40, 120 to uh, maximum here of, of uh, 280. Hmm? Uh, tensile strengths 270 to uh, 350 typically. And the elongations must be in excess of um, 38 to 40. So that's, that's, those are very large elongations. Uh, in the cold rolled grades, you have also requirements in terms of the 
the strain hardening, and the end value, and the R value. Hmm? Note that the R value is, indi you, is also indicated in what direction you have to take it you know, because of anisotropy. <coughs> so you have to take it in the uh, uh, direction 90. And remember, 90, uh, so at 90 degrees to the rolling direction, that's usually the direction where you, have, you will measure the highest R value. Hmm? And you see, of course, that uh, as I go from DC01 to DC06, I, I get an increased R value, so the materials become more formable as I go from low carbon steels to IF steels. And so again, I want to remind you of the fact that this one here is a titanium IF steel or an equivalent uh, grade uh, containing both titanium and niobium. Okay. Um, in, um, so this is the equivalent um, ASTM. Hmm? Uh, here you have um, drawing steels A and B, deep drawing steel and extra deep drawing steel, yes. And the last one here is an IF steel. Um, you can see uh, the requirement is less than 200 ppm of carbon. And uh, you can see here the alloying of uh, the addition of titanium and niobium is, is compatible with the um, um, uh, the stabilization of carbon and nitrogen. Um, again, uh, please note the fact that you know these contents of copper, uh, nickel, moly, vanadium, etc. These are, these are basically background values, yes? There's, there's, there's no addition. These, these steels are really not alloyed with uh, manganese or silicon. You don't want to do this because um, these steels, that, that would make them harder, yes? Um, and, and you want soft, very formable steels. Hmm? Uh, again, here, the, the, the um, American um, uh, standards for these cold roll grades. Again, very large elongations, yes? High R values. In this case, uh, the mean value of uh, the normal anisotropy is uh, specified. But again, large values. Yeah? Uh, in the case of the extra deep drawing steels, yes? You, the, the mean R value has to be 1.7 to 2.1, so that's really high, and also a large, a high strain hardening exponent. Right, and, and, and so here, if you would want to uh, compare these, uh, uh, these different grades, uh, Europe, uh, US, and Japan, you, uh, you can see here um, how you can compare them. So very important here, the EDDS, DCO6, um, uh, and the Japanese SPCG, yes? These are all non-aging steels, They're absolutely non-aging. So they are IF steels, basically. That's the, it, they, they are required to be IF steels. Hmm? Okay. Okay, so we have seen that um, we have these ferritic steels that are very formable. Yes, our high R values, very uh, low uh, yield strengths. And um, these, these uh, steels are, are used uh, because they're very nice to work with in a press shop. You can, you can make very complex shapes yes, uh, reliably, so uh, in terms of um, dimensionally, uh, uh, but they're soft. So, so what, what happens yes, is that um, if, you, um, if you hit, uh, for instance, a car body with a, something hard, it will leave a dent, yes, like this. Now, in Korea, people seem to be very insensitive about dents, yes, right? But in North America and Europe, people can be upset about these things very much, yes, and uh, very, very much. So don't ever dent a car in America or in or Europe. You, it, you're going to be in trouble, yes? But in Korea, people seem to be much less sensitive, yes? So um, 
but anyway, this, so these steels are particularly sensitive to this you know, because they're so soft. Hmm? Um, and, and so um, big hardening steels have been developed to try to increase the yield strength of the material, but increase it after the press hardening. Not, you could make a stronger steel, but you know, that's not what you want to do. You want, so the, the bake hardening is basically um, uh, a steel where you actually use static strain aging, the aging effect, to create a slightly stronger steel after you have made panels, after you have um, made, for instance, doors. And how does it work? Well, um, when you make uh, panels, you know, so you get your steel, it goes through uh, presses, yes? For instance, you have this, this is the side, side of, a, um, of a car here, yes? And then it gets uh, assembled, welded to a body, mm -hmm. and then you go uh, and you uh, paint the, you put the, the, the paint system on the car, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then you bake the paint. And the paint baking, so you basically dry the paint. Huh? And the, the, the paint baking is a, a low temperature aging process. Yes? So it will give you uh, uh, an annealing, basically low temperature annealing of your steel, uh, typically 150 to slightly above 200, yes, and of the order of minutes, 20 minutes, yes, so 20 minutes. And so that's a, actually a, a, a situation where we get aging in steels that can age. So, so this is the idea of this uh, big hardening steel. So you start with a uh, a sheet, say that's for instance 200 megapascal strong, yes. You work hard on it when you press form it, yes. So um, that's about 250, yeah. And then you do a paint baking. So after this, you for instance made a door, yes, uh, a door panel, mm? uh, it's paint baked and you add an extra 50 megapascal. Mm? So uh, your steel in the, the car body is now 200 megapascal. Mm? So that is the, the idea of the bake hardening. And, and so what happens in practice, so in, in the sheet here, you have some free carbon atoms. Yes? And the, 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 the challenge now in these bake hardening steels is to have a very well defined concentration of carbon atoms so that the material doesn't age, yes, before you do the press hardening, but ages rapidly, yes, after the press forming and during the paint baking. Hmm? And what happens is, of course, carbon atoms, when you do the work hardening, you have dislocations, yes, and when you do the paint baking, the uh, atoms will lock these dislocation into position, yes? And, and so um, if you would try to dent the car now, yes, you will have the strength will be not here, but here, 200, 100 megapascal stronger as a result of the work hardening and the, bake, the, the paint baking, yes? Okay. All right, so, so we, we, um, we know um, how much, so you need to dissolve carbon in, uh, get carbon in solution, right? So we know we've got a maximum 200 ppm is possible, yes? These carbon atoms, yes, uh, 200 ppm is way too much. Hmm? These carbon atoms um, that we need, yes, have to lock the dislocations that you form after a small amount of straining. Exterior panels are typically strained a few percents. Yes? 
not, not 40%, a few percent. So your dislocation density is relatively low. Yes? Right, and so these carbon atoms, what do they do? Well, uh, say you have, uh, you know, this, this is a, um, a unit cell here, yes, in uh, BCC. Uh, a dislocation that lies along the 111 uh, direction is a screw dislocation, yes, uh, if it has its Burgers factor, 111 Burgers factor, parallel to this same 111 direction. Uh, you can see the slip plane here of this dislocation is this 110 type glide plane. Hmm? This glide plane here. So this dislocation. Good. And, and so uh, this dislocation can now interact with carbon atoms that are not too far away from it. And these are in interstitial positions. So, so you've got here, here, and here three interstitial atoms, for instance, that can interact with these dislocations. Hmm? Okay. Okay. And what they will do is you have a, a lattice distortion from the screw dislocation and you have a lattice distortion from the uh, carbon atom, a tetragonal distortion, you re remember, and that will cause the carbon atoms to be attracted to the screw dislocations and the edge dislocations, yes? And as a consequence, hmm, the carbon atoms gather at the dislocation core. For instance, if it's an edge dislocation, they will tend to be in the tension part of the, um, of the dislocation core. So you'll get here a lot where you have tension, the, the carbon atoms can uh, gather. And, all right. Now, the carbon, it's the, the situation, yes, in practice is that what happens at room temperature when I make a panel, yes, I have carbon atoms and I've introduced some dislocation. What happens at room temperature? Well, at room temperature, there is a phenomenon that we call snook ordering. Snook ordering. Snook ordering. And, and what is that? That is the carbon atoms that are in the immediate vicinity of the dislocations will make a few diffusion hops yes, towards the dislocation. That happens very quickly, yes? Because remember, carbon jumps about one times per second in the iron lattice, BCC lattice, yeah? So you introduce dislocations. If the carbon atom is close enough to the dislocation, it will hop to the dislocation and pin it, yes? So, um, so that's what happens. But then pretty much that's about it. Yes, that's about it. You would have to wait for many months and years for, to see anything uh, in terms of uh, serious strengthening, yes? But if you heat up during the bake hardening process, yes, you have two processes that happen. Hmm? Uh, one process is carbon atoms moving to the dislocations, yes? So that is a diffusion process, yes? And what you can also have is carbon atoms moving together and forming carbides. For instance, cementite, yeah? Now the kinetics of these processes are not the same, yes? The, uh, and this is shown here. So if you want to, to if, if you say you, you plot the amount of carbon, yes, that's taken out of solution, yeah, that's, that's, that's not interstitial anymore, yes? It's proportional, it's, it's equal to the fraction 
will go and form carbon atmosphere and, and the rest will go and form carbide precipitates. So I get um, the, the uh, it's, these are exponential laws. You can derive them theoretically. Hmm? The first one related to the, the, the formation of uh, atmosphere is one minus exponential minus T divided by tau one yes, to the power two thirds. Yes. And for the uh, carbide precipitation, we have one minus exponential minus T divided by tau to the power three halves, yes? And, and the, the, the reason why you have these different uh, exponents is uh, due to the fact that this is purely diffusional and, and here you have a particle a growth effect, yeah? Okay? Dif different um, uh, processes, basically. So, um, so, so basically what it means is that if you look at, uh, say this would be the, the carbon content, interstitial carbon content originally, and this is the, temper the, the time at a certain temperature, you will see there'll be two steps in the uh, removal of carbon uh, from the solution, yes? Uh, one will be usually uh, the faster one, which is um, uh, so the atmosphere formation, yes? And the second one is carbonate formation. Now, when it comes to carbide formations, yes, um, the question is uh, what type of carbide do we form, yes? And, and so this is a diagram showing the kinetics, so the precipitation time temperature kinetics for super carbon supersaturated ferrite at different temperatures function of the time. And remind, I, I want to remind you of the fact that the paint baking is done at 150 to 200 degrees C, so it's around this temperature, yes? And the times are of the order of minutes. Yes, um, so that would, um, yes, minutes. So, so if I have uh, 20 minutes, if I'm right, that is, uh, what is it, 1,200 seconds? Yeah, like this. Uh, yes, 120, yeah. So about 1,000 seconds, yes. So 1,000 seconds is here, yeah. So 200, 1,000 seconds. So we're not really forming cementite, but we're forming low temperature carbides, which we, which we call transition carbides. Yeah? And, um, and they're usually called eta carbides or epsilon carbides. You may have heard about them. We're, we're not gonna go into uh, uh, too much details about these, these transition carbides. But, they, but, they're not, but they're not your regular cementite, yes? And, and they will, and, and so they, um, both these atmosphere formations and these precipitation give, give us strengthening, as you know from, uh, yeah. right, and if, if, we, if we look at these uh, precipitates here, yes, um, you, the, the reason why they grow is because you have, if it were a, a cementite particle, is because you around the, a little particle like this, you create a diffusion profile. Yes, diffusion profile, which is here. So far away from the particle, you have your regular uh, carbon content. The particle itself, say if it's cementite, it's got uh, a very high carbon content, of course. And close to the interface, the ferrite. Um, uh, ferrite cementite interface, we assume we have equilibrium. So, um, and, and so the, the carbon content is dictated by the phase diagram. So, so as a consequence, because of this uh, diffusion profile here, uh, there is a flow of carbon towards the particle. 
So you can calculate, um, you know, how much carbon needs to uh, flow into the particle for uh, growth. It's been analyzed theoretically. Uh, there is a, a simple solution to this problem by assuming that um, the, this diffusion profile is linear. You linearize this diffusion profile. And this allows you to determine the change of the radius of the particle as a function of time. Yes. And, 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 and this is the, the uh, very well known uh, relation. And once you know the radius of the particle, you can determine the volume of the, the carbide that you form as a function of time. And you see here, you find a, a function uh, where the, the time is to the power three halves. Okay? So this allows you to make simple calculations about how fast a particle will grow or if you heat up, how fast particle will go into solution. Hmm? Okay, so, good. So, anyway, um, we can, for instance, use this to, um, to study uh, the overaging, yes? Why is overaging important in this for bake hardening steels? Because a big hardening steel, when you, when you use a normal low carbon steel, yes, lo, normal aluminum killed low carbon steel, and you want to make a big hardening steel out of this one, yes, uh, remember the carbon content here will be 200 to 400 ppm, yes, very large, yes, and so. The, the way we, 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 uh, we work is by precipitating, yes, you precipitate most of this carbon, yes, during the, what's called the overaging. Remember the overaging? Hmm? The overaging. Yes. And, and here you can see, for instance, uh, uh, what the, the, the growth of these cementite particles during the overaging at 400 degrees C. Yes. So you can, you can really precipitate your carbon and keep a certain amount of, if you know the radius, you know the volume, and so you, you can calculate how much carbon you leave in solution to give you the big hardening effect. Hmm? So, so you remember? The overaging and continuous annealing. So you have you know, like this. So here you precipitate your cementite, yes. But you 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 leave a small amount of carbon in solution to give you the big hardening. Okay. For instance, as shown here, you know, you, you have your, um, your cementite particles and carbon in uh, solution. So if you have a big hardening steel, you will have cementite particles and carbon atoms in solution. Yes? And you can make big hardening grades uh, with uh, uh, batch annealing and with continuous annealing. Hmm? Okay, and uh, what I mean the most important one today is 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 the one uh, where you use the the overaging in continuous annealing. Hmm? And and it's it's really important to control the precipitation of the the cementite because you have these very large carbon contents in these low carbon steels. Yeah. Now. What about IF steels, right? So we're very happy about IF steels because, well, you know, you bind titanium, you bind carbon, so there's no problems in terms of properties along the strip. Uh, you have a very low yield strengths and tensile strengths. You have very high R values and work hardening rates. So it's a perfect steel, but it's fully stabilized. Nitrogen is stabilized by titanium. Carbon is stabilized by titanium or by niobium, so you cannot make 
bake hardening steels, yes, because you stabilized it. Okay, so that is where um, uh, we uh, the, the the idea of using niobium as a carbon stabilizer also comes in. Because so so let's. Um, a look at the uh, uh, titanium or titanium niobium IF steels. So when you have an IF steel, hmm, you have uh, uh, extremely low carbon contents. Yeah? So this would be this 200 ppm, this is 100 ppm, this is 50 ppm. So you have around this much carbon, 20 ppm. Okay. Okay. But all this carbon is stabilized, yes? It's bound to carbon. So how do you work? Well, so, so you have the microstructure, carbon is stabilized as niobium carbide. So what do we do? We heat up, but we don't heat up to 700 degrees C. We, had, we heat up to really high temperatures, 800 degrees, yes? We... Are we worried about making austenite? No, because we have so little carbon. So the, the, the AE1 temperature becomes irrelevant, yes? Now if you heat up, it's only alpha here, okay? So there's no danger that you're going to get worse R values because, yeah. so, so you heat up to very high temperatures, and what happens here, yes? is that some of the niobium or some of the titanium will, will I'm sorry, um, some of the titanium carbide and niobium carbide will go back into solution, yes? And form niobium, uh, sorry, and form carbon in, so in, uh, in solution again. And now, when we cool down, yes, of course, the solubility decreases very strongly some of the carbon may actually form carbides again, yes? But if we cool down fast enough, about 50 degrees per second, we can be left with a few ppm, less than 10 ppm, 5 or 6 ppm typically, of carbon in solution. And that's enough to give you bake hardening, good bake hardening. Um, alternatively, yes? Some clever people have said, well, if we're going to make uh, niob uh, sorry, if we're going to make big hardening steels, yes, let's not add so much niobium, or let's not add so much titanium, yes? Let's just leave carbon free at all times. And these are what are called ULC big hardening steels, ultra low carbon steels. Yes. So here we have extremely low carbon contents, and we don't stabilize. We don't stabil We don't have to stabilize it. Yeah. But the only way you can make these steels is by really uh, being able to control your secondary metallurgy and have extremely low carbon contents. Hmm? Hmm? So in this case, you just reheat. You reheat to get your texture control and your grain growth of this ULC steel, and then you just do rapid uh, cooling, uh, keeping your, your carbon in, in, uh, in solution. Again, um, you can um, uh, uh, perfectly control, for instance, for these niobium, say these niobium carbide uh, bake hardening steels. Yeah? We look, for instance, at the uh, dissolution of niobium carbide in, um, during continuous annealing. Yes? Say you have some niobium carbide. Uh, how, how long will it take for you to dissolve the niobium carbide? Uh, one minute? Three hours? Well, you can calculate it. Okay? You can calculate it because we know how the kinetics of particle uh, growth and particle dissolution. Hmm? So let's have a look, for instance, we have a big hardening steel, yes, which has um, niobium 
as used to stabilize carbon and say we have 150 ppm of niobium and 20 ppm of carbon and we look at 800 degrees C, we look at the dissolution of the uh, niobium carbide in ferrite. So we need to have some uh, data for um, the, um, so this should be niobium here. You could correct this. Uh, diffusion constant for niobium and ferrite, yes. And uh, we, we, we need also data like the, uh, the solubility product for niobium. Anyway, it's, uh, you don't have to um, know the d uh, look at the details. Just look at the results of a particle here that dissolves into the, uh, the matrix. And you can see here, it takes you about um, a little over two minutes, yes, to dissolve uh, your niobium uh, carbide. Yeah. So you can do this in a controlled manner, yes, and, um, and get your, um, and, and design your process around uh, this data. And the kinetics, what is it, what is, uh, what controls the kinetics is the diffusion of niobium in the ferrite. Because when the niobium carbide goes into solution, yes, so you have carbon goes into solution and niobium goes into solution, yes? Okay. Now, carbon is a really fast diffuser, yes? Really fast diffuser, yeah? So the dissolution of niobium carbon is not controlled by the carbon diffusion, but it's controlled by niobium diffusing away from the niobium carbide particle, okay? But you see, it's fast, yes? It's fast, and, uh, and you can do it in a continuous annealing uh, furnace quickly. Um, big hardenable steels, um, if you look at the big hardenable steel and a non-big hardenable steel, the microstructure, exactly the same. I mean, obviously, what makes a big hardenable steel, uh, big hardenable are extreme, are PPM levels of carbon, so you're not going to see this on, in the microstructure. Hmm? So this is an example here of a big hardenable steel. Um, Typical ferrite grains, yes. Um, so uh, here, the uh, uh, yes, the kinetics usually um, measuring the kinetics of carbon in solution. It's not something you can do chemically. Because when, when, if you go to a lab and you say, okay, this is a piece of steel. I think it's got 200 ppm of carbon. Please give me the carbon content. Then what usually happens is the chemist will basically destroy the sample, yes? Destroy the sample some way or another, yes? And then measure how much carbon is there in the iron, et cetera, and mag magnesium, et cetera, yeah? Uh, manganese, etc. Um, but if you go to the chemist and you say, it has, this sample contains 200 ppm of carbon, tell me how much carbon is in solid solution. That is another, that's very difficult, yes? You, you know, um, and you need special techniques to analyze how much carbon is in solid solution, yes? Typically, uh, people will use a technique called internal friction, because in internal friction you can measure, uh, you, it's a technique that's sensitive to interstitial atoms like carbon or nitrogen. But it's, um, it's not an, uh, a simple technique, yes? So, um, so what do we do? Well, we measure the, um, the mechanical properties, basically. Hmm? We um, uh, what we do, yes, um, okay, so um, you will take your sample, your big hardenable steel, yes, this will be a big hardenable steel, and you will pre-strain it. So here I'm, I'm pre-straining my big hardenable steel up to this point. Yeah? So in this case, I've strained it about 
How much? About 5%, okay? 0.05. Okay, and that's, that's going to, um, yeah? Um, okay, and then I take this steel and I'm aging it. Yes, I'm aging it after pre-straining. Yes, that means I will take it, in this particular case, uh, aging time, um, this one I, uh, this particular thing, example here, was 170 degrees C. So 20 minutes minutes yeah, at 170 degrees C. So, so what you get then, you take the same material, this is what you get. You get a material, of course, with a, a yield point and a yield point elongation, yes, because it's been aged, yes, okay? And we can now measure this, the difference here, this increase in strength from so the, what's called the yield uh, plateau and the, the flow strength stress I had here. And we can measure this as a function of time, mechanically. Yes? And if we do this, for instance, uh, for pre-stains of 5% and we, so we, we strain it 5% and then we put it in a, fir in a in a, a heat it at 50 degrees and we make 20 samples and the first sample we take out after, five, after 10 seconds, after 30 seconds, after 60 seconds and we measure this delta sigma. So what we see is we, we see an increase in strength, yes? And here there's a small plateau and then it continues to increase and then it seems to decrease, okay? This is, this is how bake hardening uh, is evaluated. Now, the, what is in, important for the, the industry is, is this, is the, about 20 minutes. Hmm? So, uh, this is 10 minutes, 20 minutes, yes, 20 minutes at 50 degrees C, that's, um, that's very, uh, very um, low temperature. I, actually, I chose this temperature because it illustrated the fact that you see you have two levels of things happening here. First is the atmosphere formation, and then this stage here is the precipitation stage. So first we, you form atmospheres, then you form precipitates, and then the strength decrease here is because the precipitates continue to grow. Yes? They continue to grow, and you, they coarsen, Yes? And then you lose strengthening because they pick, they take away carbon, yes, and and they become larger. And because they are larger, they, they, they provide less uh, strength. Hmm? Okay. Now, um, if you're ever involved in aging uh, studies, uh, you will see that things are more complex. Uh, in general, why are they more complex? Because, um, for instance, we already talked about this, uh, very often your steels are alloyed with elements that may interact with carbon. So in addition to carbon in solid solution, carbon at dislocations, carbon at uh, carbides, you also have carbon close to substitutional elements which will behave differently and then what's really important we also have boundaries grain boundaries and grain boundaries also act as sinks for carbon yes so when you ask your chemists tell me how much solid solution carbon I have this is solid solution carbon this is solid solution carbon, this is solid solution carbon, and this is solid solution carbon, yes? This is precipitated carbon, yes? So there are many different types of uh, carbon in solid solution, and they will all impact the mechanical properties differently. Hmm? 
we know we know this, right? Carbon in grain boundaries is probably uh, uh, causes the Hall patch effect. Yeah. Um, this one here, the aging effects. This one here, precipitation hardening, etc. Okay. So, but let's have a look at grain boundary carbon in uh, normal situations in a, uh, a bake hardening steel. So if we have, to look at what happens to bake hardening steel. Hmm? Uh, so here it's cold rolled, yes, yes. We heat it up for in continuous annealing, then we cool down quickly, yes, and then we over aging, do the over aging to precipitate carbide, hmm? and then we cool down to room temperature, okay? Okay, and then it goes to the press shop, for instance, where it gets small amount of deformation, few percents, yes, and then you go to the bake hardening. Bake hardening at typically, say, 170 degrees C, and then that's quite long, yeah, 20 minutes, okay? So what happens here? Well, let's have a look at the carbon. We have carbon interstitial, carbon at dislocations, and carbon at grain boundaries. Yes. How does this? Uh, how you know? How can you think about the distribution? Hmm? Hmm? So, uh, at at room temperature, carbon goes into grain boundaries. Yes. Because remember, carbon solubility in ferrite is nothing, yes? So, and if a material is very well recrystallized, there are no dislocations to go to, yes? So it will go, uh, carbon will go in the grain boundaries. So at the start here, in the, uh, at the start, we get of the uh, annealing, we get lots of carbon in grain boundaries uh, and we get um, some of it in uh, interstitial, uh, interstitial carbon. Yeah. When, when we heat up, however, yes, we heat this up, yes, the carbon in the grain boundaries uh, leaves the grain boundaries pretty quickly yes, and we, most of the carbon will be interstitial. Yes. Most of it is interstitial. And then when I cool down, yes, it increases the amount of carbon in the boundaries again. Remember, we don't have much dislo many dislocations, yes. Uh, temperature constant, temperature constant. In this case, in this case, it's assumed that we don't form carbides, okay. For instance, it's an ultra low carbon steel. Okay, and then we continue cooling to room temperature. Uh, the, um, the carbon interstitial decreases and the carbon goes back to grain boundaries. Yes. Deformation here creates a large amount of dislocations. The dislocations, amount of dislocation increase. So when I do the low temperature annealing, yes, a lot of the carbon goes to dislocations, yes? And, um, and that's, that's what causes this decrease in uh, interstitial uh, carbon. And with time, you also get an increase in the amount of carbon uh, that goes to grain boundaries, yes? So this is an important aspect. Um, if you don't have many dislocations, yes, um, and you have a well annealed structure, there's going to be lots of carbon. The, the impact of the grain boundaries will be relatively important. Yeah. If you have small grain sizes, also, impact of the grain boundaries are important. But once you strain the material, uh, the impact of grain boundaries are, are um, uh, smaller. Okay, so let's have a look at some uh, typical bake hardening steels. What kind of compositions do we have? Hmm? 
Okay, this is a, a big hardening steel here um, uh, that's been vacuum treated, yes, that uh, has uh, niobium as a stabilizing element and titanium to stabilize the nitrogen. Okay, so there's not much in this material with the exception of carbon, niobium, and titanium. Uh, what are the uh, properties here? It's, it's still a, a pretty soft material, 300 uh, MPa yield strength. Um, what, uh, okay, what I want to focus on is how much bake hardening you get. Yeah? Typically 50 megapascal. Okay? That's, that's the, the, the amount of bake hardening you can get. Um, I also want to mention the fact that when people evaluate or quote uh, the bake hardening values here, you will see either BH2 values, BH2 values, or BH0 values. What's a BH0 value? Well, there is no pre-strain in this case. In, in the, uh, how does it work? You measure the uh, yield strength of your material, yes? And then you uh, measure uh, the, so you take your material and you strain it, yes? So you can measure the yield strength. Yeah? And then you take the same material, don't strain it. You anneal it, uh, typically 20 minutes at 170, and, and you measure the tensile strength, stress, um, stress strain curve, excuse me. And so this increase in the uh, yield strength, yes, is called BH0. In the case of BH2, what we do is first you take your material, yes, you strain it 2%, yes, excuse me, you strain it 2%, this much, okay. So that allows you to measure the yield strength and the flow stress, okay? Then you unload the material and you anneal it, typically 170 degrees, 20 minutes. And then you retest the same material. You get an aged stress strain curve, yes? And so you can determine what is the amount of work hardening, the strength due to work hardening, the strength due to uh, bake hardening. Hmm? And this is BH2, yes? So not, not, not this here, right? Not the difference in yield strengths, but the difference between the flow strength and the yield strength. The, the flow strength and the yield strength after paint baking. Okay? Um, right, so some uh, data here. Uh, standards data on uh, bake hardenable steels, uh, low carbon bake hardenable steels, about 400 uh, ppm of carbon. Um, what's interesting here is, of course, what are, according to the standards, the minimum required BH2 values. Yes, so 35 megapascal is typical minimum standard requirements for bake hardening. Hmm? ASTM, uh, you see uh, the BHS, bake hardenable steels. Um, uh, compositional ranges here. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, these are the, the strengths. The, okay, so the bake hardening index here is uh, given as the upper yield and the lower yield. Let me see if I have values here. No, I don't. Okay. Okay. Uh, ju just remember um, that um, standards uh, usually minimally require 35 MPa, and that in the in normal cases you can count on a 50 MPa typically. Yeah. And um, for low carbon steels or IF steels or ultra low carbon steels, 
um, of course, you can do aging tests with other types of steels, like big hardening steels or trip steels or other complex phase steels, uh, and they will give you an other big hardening response, yes? But um, which may be uh, very much higher, actually. Okay, now, another uh, uh, problem is that um, related to the, um, uh, these IF steels and uh, aluminum killed low carbon steels is that uh, uh, they, they do have this inherently low strength, yes, and that um, uh, car makers and other um, uh, users of steels um, uh, are always interested in light weighting things, yes, in making things lighter. Yeah? And, um, and so there is a need also for steels that are stronger, so we can use, so they can use thinner gauge, thinner gauge materials, yes? And so um, the, uh, this has led to IF steels and aluminum killed low carbon steels, which are alloyed with uh, phosphorus, manganese, silicon, um, or other elements, but usually phosphorus, manganese, or silicon, to increase the strength by solid solution hardening, yes? And you see here that, of course, we already know that phosphorus, manganese, and silicon give, give us a, a lot of strength, yes? And that phosphorus gives us a lot of strengthening for very small uh, additions, yes? And that is, that's, this is an, one of the areas in which we will add phosphorus to steels, yes? Mm -hmm. In uh, solid solution strengthened steels. And this, for instance, is an example here uh, taken from European standards where uh, we have so-called REFOS or phosphorus uh, solid solution strengthened steels. Mm -hmm where phosphorus is actually used as an alloying element to increase the strength. Hmm? Um, and, and you can see here uh, strength levels depending on the amount of um, uh, phosphorus can now increase to 300, uh, 350 uh, yield strength, 400, 500 in tensile strength. And again, uh, these are um, uh, internationally recognized grades. Uh, you have um, REFOS standards for in, in Europe and in, um, in the US. And okay. One of the things that happens, of course, with phosphorus and um, and uh, many people um, are always worried about the use of phosphorus as an alloying element is embrittlement, yes. Now, um, when these IF steels uh, uh, first came, uh, were used, um, uh, they were uh, used very widely and when the uh, refossed IF steels uh, were developed, uh, there was also uh, very uh, much interest in them. But, uh, um, and they looked like very safe materials because the amount of phosphorus that you added was really low, hmm? around 500 ppm. So below the danger level where the phosphorus goes to grain boundaries and embrittles the steel. Yes. But it turned out that um, um, there is a phenomenon uh, called secondary work embrittlement uh, that was observed. That means, uh, take for instance, you make a cup, yes? You form a cup, yes? Uh, made of a phosphorus alloyed IF steel, and the cup is perfect, it doesn't break or anything. But what happens is that uh, and this happens often in, um, in uh, press shops, is when you press apart 
you don't press it at once. You, it can go to different press stages. So you, and during this uh, processing, you deform already deformed material. Yes? And it turns out that um, these um, phosphorus alloy steels were kind of sensitive to this secondary yeah, extra work uh, fracture. And you can see here, um, so if you, uh, this is the as drawn cup. If you try to deform this cup again, like making it slightly wider, uh, you see that it will be behave brittle, in a brittle fashion. And it will behave in a brittle fashion um, if you do the deformation at slightly lower temperatures. Yes? So that got people very worried, of course, uh, because as you can see, it's, it's quite impressive, the, the embrittlement. Uh, so, um, right. so let me go back here. So what, what did, it's not in the notes, I, um, I'm sorry about this. So what did, what did they do? What, did, uh, what do you do to prevent this? You add some boron. So that's why many of these steels, these phosphorus containing grades uh, nowadays uh, contain some boron, very small amounts of boron, 10 ppm, yes. Uh, the boron goes to the grain boundaries and uh, because it also uh, likes to segregate to grain boundaries and enrich in the grain boundaries, it doesn't do any harm at the grain boundaries, the boron, but it prevents the phosphorus from going to grain boundaries because there are only so many uh, positions that are available for atoms on grain boundaries. So uh, this grain boundary competition between uh, boron and phosphorus is always in advantage of the, the boron and the phosphorus stays in solid solution. And you don't get this um, secondary work and brittlement problem in practice. Right, and let's, let's just um, finish uh, today with this slide here. The, um, with the uh, aluminum killed steels and the IF steels, yes. um, and, and structural steels we'll see, um, we'll, we'll start uh, with on um, uh, uh, Thursday this week. Um, we, we know we, we have a, a basic problem, yes? And the, the, the problem is that we have uh, low strengths, yes? We, of course, we can increase them by um, doing, for instance, bake hardening, or we can do a solid solution strengthening with phosphorus, manganese, with silicon additions, uh, but only so much so, yes? So, um, what um, people uh, have been uh, developing since um, in the last decade, yes, uh, there's been lots of development, are um, steels with higher strengths. Yeah, so, so we can have higher strength um, um, uh, engineering uh, constructions uh, that are also lighter weight, yes, and, um, and of course, one of the um, problems that needs to be addressed is that uh, as we increase strength, yes, um, you usually see that plasticity measured as total elongation or uniformization and value will tend to decrease. Yes. So, and, and that has been uh, so one of the major challenges in the development of higher strength steels is how do you uh, develop uh, strength yes, uh, and keep very high formability in your, in your steels, in these high strengths? And so we'll talk about a few of these solutions um, on uh, Thursday. Thank you.